will call the meeting to order. Uh, thanks everybody for being here on this fine spring day. And, uh, we'll start with a moment of silence. Thank you. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, we have a draft agenda in front of us. Can I have a motion to do the agenda? I got Kelly first, support? Support. Christy, any discussion? Okay, all in favor, raise your hand, say aye. 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 Okay, agenda approved. We'll get started tonight with our recognition. Dr. Matthews? Thank you. Uh, tonight we have our students of the month, and uh, we'll let uh, the video roll. Elizabeth's parents are Rebecca and Dave. She has a sister named Madison. Elizabeth went to Lakes Elementary. She enjoys dance, playing outside, and hanging out with friends. According to one of her teachers, Elizabeth is a model student who gives her very best each and every day. I just really like connecting with my friends and uh, I like a uh, band. I want to be a photographer and take pictures. Um, to me, it makes me like proud of myself and like makes me think that I'm doing the right thing. Cody is the son of Dan and Laura. He has two sisters, Brooklyn and Madison. Cody has a cat named Oreo. He went to Lakes Elementary and he enjoys playing basketball, football, and video games. One of his teachers described him as a hardworking student who is a leader in class. Um, I really like our music program, especially our orchestra. It's really fun to play our instruments with each other and the teachers are really amazing. I would like to be an outdoor guide. I really like hunting and fishing and I would like to share that with others. I'm extremely honored to be nominated among all these amazing students and teachers. Macy is the daughter of Kimberly and Robert. She has two dogs, Wrigley and Sherwin. Macy attended Parkside Elementary. She enjoys lacrosse, golf, hanging with friends and family, camping, and playing with her dogs. According to one of her teachers, Macy is kind to everyone, very inclusive. Meeting new people and the teachers because they're so awesome. I kind of want to be an interior designer because my aunt does it and it just really interests me. It means a lot because I have a positive impact on the school and people notice it. Andre's parents are Andrea, Chad, and stepdad Cody. Andre grew up in the state of Washington before moving to Michigan and becoming part of our ERMS family. He has three dogs, Bailey, Lily and Paxi. Andre enjoys building with Legos, watching TV, and hanging out with friends and family. According to one of his teachers, Andre works extremely hard in class and is kind and accepting to everyone. I like that I can make a lot of friends and I also like to, that I can learn new things and I have really nice teachers and, and they all help me out and uh, that's my favorite part of school. An engineer. It, it means that I have worked hard and and know that I have ex succeeded in, try in, in trying that and trying hard, and that. Presley's parents are Aaron, Chad, and stepmom Tracy. She has three step siblings: Noah, Brianna, and Parker. Presley has three cats: Little Bear, Pippin, and Yo Yo. She attended Rockford Christian and Lakes Elementary schools. Presley enjoys being outside, going to the gym and hanging out with friends. Um, my favorite part about school is the staff and my friends because I'm a social person, so yeah. When I grow up, I want to be a marine biologist because ever since I can remember, I've loved the water and I've grown up on lakes, so. It means that all of my hard work paid off um, in my good grades and it means that all my family members and the teachers are proud of me. Otto's parents are Don and Laurel. He has a younger sister, Madeline, and he has two dogs, Lou and Duncan. Otto went to Belmont Elementary. He enjoys basketball, football, and track. One of Otto's teachers describes him as a great student who is always willing to help others. There are a lot of things I like about school, but the thing I like most is the athletic programs because they're really good. I also like the um, different things you can do, like there's a lot of different opportunities and different people to meet. Right now, I don't really know, but I want to do something that has to do with like health and sports. So it means a lot because it shows that all my hard work paid off over the course of the school year and it couldn't have been done without the teachers. So I just want to say thank you for that. 
Linnea is a sixth grade student on our Bar and Bates team. Parents are Kelly and Jacob. Linnea has one sibling named Zachary and five pets, a dog named Tipper, a cat named Boo, two fish named Nemo and Hunter, and a snail named Cecilia. Linnea attended Roguewood Elementary School and is active in softball and plays percussion in the band. When I grow up, I want to be a teacher like my mom, and I also want to work with animals, so maybe a zookeeper. My favorite thing about school is reading and writing, and I also really like that our school has a dog named Chili. I don't really know because a teaching is probably my perfect job, but I also would really want to win the lottery, so I'm not sure what I would choose. I think it's great that students are recognized for their hard work, and I'm really proud to be one of those students. Dylan is a sixth grade student on our Marlow Van Oss Ferguson team. Parents are Suzanne and Scott. Dylan has a sibling named Alyssa as well as a bunny named Bubbles. Dylan attended Roguewood Elementary School and is active in soccer and plays cello in the orchestra. Uh, I want to be probably like someone that works at an aquarium or something like that because I like working with animals. I like that the teachers are really good and they like teach in a fun way. I would probably rather work at the perfect job because like, it's more fun getting the money than just winning the lottery and just getting it. It means a lot because the teachers and everyone's, like, un like understands how hard I'm working. And Morgan is a seventh grade student. Parents are Aaron and Matt. Morgan has one sibling named Cole, as well as a dog named Odin. Morgan attended Valley View Elementary School and is active in field hockey, lacrosse, water polo, and plays tuba in the band. When I grow up, I would like to be a special education teacher because I'm really inspired for job shadowing when I job shadowed my dad. My favorite thing about school is science class and I really enjoy chemistry and the human body unit. I would want to be stranded with my cousin Ray because she's extremely lighthearted and she'd make the situation a lot less nerve-wracking. It means a lot to me that my teachers thought or saw that I was working hard in class and recognized what I was doing. Blake is a seventh grade student. Parents are Trisha and Josh. Blake has two siblings named Brayden and Brock, as well as a dog named Maisie. Blake attended Valley View Elementary School and is active in football, basketball, and lacrosse. What I want to be when I grow up, I want to be an athlete or something to do with sports because I just love playing sports and watching them. My favorite thing about school is hanging out with my friends and, you know, see all of them. Hudson Hensley because he brings a good attitude. Um, it's a big accomplishment to me, but I got to catch up to my brother, and I feel like I can keep improving. Malaya is an eighth grade student. Parents are Andrea and Tavis. Malaya has three siblings named Marcella, Makaya, and Mateo, as well as a dog named Jazzy and a fish named Nemo. Malaya attended Roguewood Elementary School and is active in track, lacrosse, competitive cheer, and tumbling. When I grow up, I want to be a psychologist. My favorite thing is definitely meeting new people and making new friendships. Um, if I had a million dollars, I would definitely put it to the things me and my family need and like others who might need help. It means a lot that I can be recognized by teachers and my peers by just doing my day-to-day -day life. Aiden is an 8th grade student. Parents are Sarah and Joshua. Aiden has two siblings named Landon and Dylan, as well as a dog named Layla. Aiden attended Roguewood Elementary School and is active in football, soccer, and plays violin in the orchestra. When I grow up, I want to be a professional football player. My favorite thing about school is the orchestra program. I would buy some better electronics. It means that I'm being recognized for the good things that I do in class. Do we have any of our students of the month in the crowd tonight? Bring it back. <laughs> Congratulations on your recognition and thank you very much for taking the time to be here tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, up next is uh, Bill's basketball team, Dr. Matthews. Thank you. Uh, tonight we have an opportunity to recognize some of our student athletes uh, from Rockford High School. Uh, they've provided uh, wonderful experiences for all of us uh, this winter uh, season. And uh, you heard on the, the Middle School Student of the Month uh, videos, uh, uh, some of the students talk about uh, their hard work. And uh, there's nobody in the school that probably works as hard as some of our student athletes. They uh, not only are great athletes, but they're great students. 
and they represented our community very well uh, this year. If you saw any of the interviews, for example, with the girls' basketball team during the state championship uh, uh, run, they, they were well-spoken, they, they talked about the community, and, and they just represented our community very well. And so we have a lot to be proud of. And so tonight I'd like to introduce Cole Andrews, who will introduce the coach in, in each individual team. And uh, then we have certificates that the coach can give to uh, the girls. And so tonight uh, we'll let uh, Cole begin. Cole, why don't you stand over here so we can get you on the, yep. the camera. Dr. Matthews, Board of Education, appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Um, why don't we have the girls uh, team coming right now, girls basketball team. And if they could come over and stand by you so uh, over here. Springer can get them on yep. the video, that'd be awesome. Well, first of all, you set up very, very well. Uh, this is a great group of girls here, um, young ladies rather. Um, and they uh, had a great year last year, and it's really hard to come back and, and, and improve in this year. So obviously, first time in school history. Why don't we let the coach kind of swing on down so the girls can keep filling in there? <laughs> it's crowded here tonight. So anyways, um, uh, great season. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I want to turn it over to Co Coach Wilson to kind of talk about the season, talk about these fine uh, young ladies here. Boy, I don't know what's more nerve-wracking, this or being at the Breslin Center. But, uh, this is something. I'd like to thank Dr. Matthews and the rest of the school board for inviting us out. Uh, what a tremendous honor this is to be here and so proud of these girls. And uh, we had a lot of highlights this year. We won our first um, OK Red Conference Championship since 2010. That was something that we really, that was a, that was a goal of ours really from really starting six years ago. And, um, you know, we realized that potential this year and really proud of that. And then came our, our, our district run, and uh, we were able to get our, our fourth district championship in a row, which, which is first time in school history that we've won four in a row. So that was pretty awesome. And then uh, after that, we were able to secure our second regional title in a year. Uh, uh, excuse, excuse me, our second regional title in a row, which is also the first time in school history. So let's give them another round of applause. For that. Of course, we made our second year in a row to the Breslin Center, and um, we're able to this time win our first ever school state championship. So, nice job. <laughs> during that run at the Breslin Center, I would like to, to do a couple of special thank yous. Um, our administration, Dr. Matthews, Cole Andrews, and, and everybody else that was involved made it just a first class opportunity and experience for, for our girls, uh, whether it's running an awesome limousine bus for us to go down or letting the, the, the school body get off school and come and support the girls. It was just an amazing experience and so much of our community came out. So I'd literally like to give our administration and, and our community a round of applause also for, for just coming out and making it really a community event. And of course, uh, the, the, the real credit goes to our, our coaches and, and our players. Um, you guys had an historical year. Um, we talked with our seniors before the, the season started about leaving behind a legacy. Um, what I'm probably most proud of of this group is we were BCAM Academic All-State. Uh, our GPA this year was an accumulative GPA of 3.85. And uh, yeah, thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> and uh, we set an MHSA record for most wins in a single season with, with 28. So those two things, along with the state championship, are just what an unbelievable group of girls and um, something I certainly will never forget. So with that, I'd like to invite Coach Remtema to come up and we have some certificates. Yep. Anna Whitepitch. All right. <laughs> Emily Obadon. Wildman. Aubrey Vickertsis. Ryan Whitford. Grace Lyons. Uh, Sierra Rosenzweig, who's not here. Kayla McLaren. Bree Rodriguez, Maddie Whitford, 
Kate Frohmeyer. <laughs> Alyssa Wyfitch, who's not here. Tessa Gregory. <laughs> Sienna Wolf. <laughs> and Celia Sara. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Lady Awesome. Lady Awesome here. So I guess we'll have you probably it's be easier to go this way. Yep. Okay. I'm thinking maybe slide around that way. There you go. Okay. So gymnastics. Thank you. Thank you. So our next team uh, is our state champion. Uh, girls gymnastics team, and so we're excited to have them here as well. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Uh, it's always fun to have one state championship in a year. We're fortunate enough to have multiple in a year in, in the season. And uh, I've said this before when we presented last year, and I'll say it again. Um, probably misrepresented in terms of how athletic our gymnastics uh, group is. You're talking about some of the the best female and best overall athletes in the entire school seen right here, and that's no disrespect to any of our other programs, but um, what you see in gymnastics is truly incredible, and a lot of credit goes to Coach Michelle and, and organizing this group, and back-to-back uh, -back state champions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Coach Michelle to talk about gymnastics this year. Well, thank you all for having us. We are glad to be here, and I'm, I'm glad that we're still celebrating these girls and how hard they work this year because um, I, I mean, state now feels like another lifetime ago, but it's only about a month ago. So we, um, it was um, such an honor to coach this team this year, and they worked hard all season long. They are some of the best athletes in the entire school. Um, gymnastics is um, both power and strength, and it's four different events, and it is different training for each of those events, and so they work very hard to um, be ready for each and every event. Um, there were 16 girls on the team this year, 15 competed, we had one out injured, sorry. Um, we had all 15 qualify individually to um, regionals this year, um, and then we had eight more qualify individually into state this year. Uh, we were undefeated the entire season, so um, whether it was an invite or our conference meets, we won um, every competition we entered this year, which that's the first time I've ever been able to say that, so that's really cool. Um, and then, so yes, and so we won back-to-back -back state championships, and this year we, uh, we finished strong. Uh, we won last year, and it was great, and we celebrated, and it was awesome, but we, our last event was not our best event, and this year um, we came out and hit our last event and kind of put a mark on it, and uh, it felt good <laughs> to win this year. So, um, and then we came back, we had eight compete individually um, the second day, and we had six that place, so we have six all-state athletes. Um, and yeah, so we just had an amazing season, and I'm just so grateful for all of their hard work this year. Maria 
Maria Clemente Nieves. Kate Wilcox. So yes, and then Kaylee Burke was unable to make it today, but. Um, yeah, so, and of this team, we only have one senior graduating, so we hope to stand back here in front of you again next year, so. We won't miss that senior, but we are. Yeah, thank you all. They were back, they were runner up three years ago. So they made a lot of trips over here in the last three years. So hopefully we'll make another one. Yes. Congratulations in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, we have one more state champion to recognize this evening, and that is our state champion diver. And so we'll introduce uh, our coach and our diver. Coach Chuck, Coach Carson, uh, Julian Cardenas. I think I got that right. Yes. I got the name right. All right, um, I don't know if many people have Look seen the camera. The, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know if many people have seen, di seen diving, but uh, what Julian does is pretty incredible. I'm not, I don't consider myself a diving expert. I'm going to let Coach talk a little bit about this, but what I've noticed is that he jumps a lot higher off the board, and his splash is a lot smaller, so he's pretty incredible. Uh, really is a gymnast and a diver all in one. He's, he's, Julian's an unbelievable athlete. Coach, I'll let you take it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Matthews and the rest of the board. Um, Julian is a junior, and he was first in everything this year. All of his, all of our um, dual meets, MISCA, which is Michigan Interscholastic Swim Coaches Association. It's a, a special meet. He took first at that. Um, took first at our conference, took first at our regionals, and then took first at state. It's been a very good year for him. Very good. Uh, the other thing he did this year, which hasn't been done for quite a while in some places, um, he scored records at other schools and at ours. <laughs> yes, he broke the record at Zealand. He broke both records at West Ottawa. Yes. And he broke both the pool and the school record for six dives at our pool. Hadn't been done in our pool since, 19, since 2015. So he's, uh, and he'll be back next year. <laughs> <laughs> Makes my life a whole lot easier. <laughs> my life a whole lot easier. And I have been his coach since seventh grade. Oh. So it's been a wonderful thing. I've always enjoyed having him around. And he's a wonderful diver. And very humble, likes to stand on the board or watch the other guys and tell them, hey, you need to do this. Mm -hmm. So they listen to him more than they listen to me. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Excellent job, my friend. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, some may wonder why we take the time to recognize these student athletes at a board meeting, and and the answer is uh, because they represent our community. They they are part of who we are, and and they represent us very well. And for their time and effort, and also their ability, we wanted to make sure that all of our community knows who they are and and what they provide for us as a community. And so it's it's appropriate that we take the time to recognize them uh, this evening. So I'll turn it back to you, okay. uh, Mr. Ford. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Up next is our consent agenda items. We have four items tonight. Spring coaches, approval of minutes from our March 13th meeting, presentation of bills, and there's an REF memo of understanding. Can I have a motion to approve our consent agenda? Move. Patricia moves support. Support Kelly. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. And we're into reports. Item one, our student representative, Olivia. Good to be back after break. I hope everyone else had a good spring break and had some good time off and relaxed. 
Um, so today, I'm very excited to introduce you all to Camille Dockey. She oh. is the next student representative for next year, for 2023 and 2024. I have, there's so many things to say about Camille. She is the most kind-hearted person ever. She, everyone you meet is always like, I love Camille, I love Camille. She's <laughs> awesome. She's so selfless. She always has a smile on her face or a smile lights up a room. She's so helpful. She's so kind-hearted to everyone. She's just, she's amazing. She's so helpful at Rockford, and I'm excited, so excited to see what she does next year and what she does for Rockford. So I'm yeah. excited too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Camille. <laughs> okay, so next we have prom. Um, so our prom this year is on May 6th. It is Run for the Roses. It is on the day of the Kentucky Derby, so we decided to do something similar to that, not like wholeheartedly about the Kentucky Derby, but just like about like the flowers because it is at Frederick Meyer Gardens. So we have two ticket options this year. We have a dinner included ticket and then a no dinner included ticket. And we start selling tickets this week, Thursday, until the 28th. Um, and then we have, the dinner is also posted around the school and what we have provided there. And then we have a Relay for Life bake sale going on this week during all three lunches, Monday through Thursday this week. I bought a cupcake today. It was an Oreo cupcake, and it was very delicious. So uh, everyone, or if you are at the school doing lunches, I highly recommend going to get a dessert because it's really, really good. Uh, we are also having a blood drive this week. Interact Club is hosting a blood drive. Wednesday, April 19th, they're hosting it at the high school in the gym. And then Thursday, April 20th, it is at the Rockford Community Cabin. And then if you donate for the first time, you will receive a $10 gift card. And then spring sports have started up. Baseball, they have had really a past few really good games. So their recent one was against North Hills 5-3, and girls soccer won against Forest Hills East Northern, Northern. Forest Hills Northern 2-1, and then tennis also won. Is it Hudson Bell? Is that Hudson Bell? Yes. Yes. It's Hudson Bell. Hudson. What? Was that one? No. Okay. <laughs> and then we have graduation after grad. So graduation is coming up very, very soon. Um, May 22nd at Calvin University at 7 p.m. Um, and then after grad is May 23rd. Busing is also provided. Buses leave at 7.30 p.m. The event starts at 8. And then we leave event at 1 a.m. And then get back to the high school at 1.30. Any questions? Is this your final meeting or you'll be joining us in the next meeting? Yeah, I will be here for the next meeting. Perfect. Yes, I will be here for the next meeting. I do have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, will Mr. Hosford be at school uh, the, after the uh, after school uh, graduation event uh, since you're there till 1.30 in the morning? Absolutely. You know, All right, thank you both. Appreciate it. Team report, Tonight we have a collaborative team report from uh, our elementary report will be presented by uh, interim uh, principal, uh, Kyle A. Uh, you have a, we want you up here so you can be on camera. Awesome. You have a photogenic face. Face yeah. array. All right. Dr. Matthews, Board of Education, Central Office staff, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, some things that the elementary staff and students have been up to so far. Um, just like everybody, uh, spring is a very busy time. Um, we wrapped up March's reading month just prior to spring break happening, and that's always a great time to be able to see um, some fun and innovative ways that our teachers are bringing reading to life in their classrooms. Um, so that was a great time. Uh, we have our spring events coming up at the schools. So carnival type events that are happening. Um, food trucks, inflatables, um, all kinds of different activities for students to be able to participate in. Um, and those are on various dates uh, throughout this month for um, each elementary school. We have a number of field trips happening across the district with our elementary students. Um, 
For Crestwood particularly, we have our fifth graders that are attending museum school, and I know a couple of other schools do that as well. Um, similar to what our fourth grade students do when they do zoo school for a week, we do museum school. Um, we have a trip to Lansing, a trip to downtown Rockford scheduled, um, Greenfield Village for our fifth graders. Um, so lots of exciting things happening. And um, to offset the fun, we have some testing coming up too. Uh, so hope we can fit that in there also. Uh, we have NSTEP coming up, and we have our, uh, our spring NWEA testing that will happen as well. Uh, we're preparing for our graduation walkthroughs. We have a number of teachers that have participated in lab classrooms over the course of the last couple of weeks. Um, our DK most recently participated in some math training here in the district. Um, we have teachers across the district from elementaries going to uh, various trainings like Adaptive Schools or IXL. Um, our Spanish Immersion currently is going through their lottery process um, to determine who will be a part of those uh, programs. We have our DK and K screenings that are happening um, this week. A couple happened last week, so we're starting to get through that process as well and figure out um, which ones are going to DK, which are going to K. Um, and then, uh, you wouldn't know it today, but with some nice weather coming up, we have some um, outdoor learning that's happening as well. Um, across the district district and our schools. Um, I don't have a great PowerPoint like she did, so um, any questions for me regarding things that are happening in the elementary world? Thank you, Mr. Amy. Uh, you will return in momentarily uh, in our well. right. So our secondary report is presented by uh, Ms. Kelly Anthony, our freshman center principal. Thank you, Dr. Matthews, Board of Education Central Office for having me. Not only do I not have a PowerPoint, I also do not have inflatables to boast about or a zoo school. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> but there's plenty happening in our secondary buildings. Um, as with the elementary buildings, we are getting through the state testing process. So last week that was PSAT and SAT and work keys. And then moving forward, we'll be looking at MSTEP for students in grades 6, 7, and 8, and 11. Um, huge task uh, for those building coordinators. Um, they've put a lot of effort in, particularly you think about Rockford High School, 1,800 students, some of them taking multiple tests. Uh, I think Mr. Hosford said they had 2,400 um, assessments last week. So a uh, huge thank you to the building coordinators for doing that, as well as for our staff for proctoring, and then parents for dealing with your kids when they come home and, and our students. We know that they work really hard on it. Um, take it take it very seriously and, and give their absolute best effort. We appreciate that. Um, this week, uh, ninth through 12th grade uh, staff are welcoming parents for parent-teacher conferences. Um, and that's at all the buildings, including River Valley. We also have our virtual teachers hosting parent-teacher conferences. Um, so it's great. We have a blend of in-person sessions and Google Meet sessions. So kind of what works for the parent is what we're going to have work for us. And it's been great so far. They sign up for a slot. Um, they show up to the slot where they were expected. And it's been really nice to see parents back in our buildings a little bit this year. Uh, it is also hiring season. And so we're preparing to say goodbye to some of our really seasoned veteran teachers. We're going to miss their experience dearly, but it's also exciting to see the next generation of Rockford educators coming in. Um, the pool of candidates seems to be quite quite good for most of our positions, and that's always exciting, but also the quality of those people, the caliber of the people who want to come and work here um, just says a lot about our district and our community. Uh, we're also in the process of working through scheduling, and it's quite a process at the secondary level, but we're in the phase of building that master schedule, which is kind of putting together the puzzle of what the students asked for with what space we have and what staff we have and trying to figure out how to mesh that together before they're actually placed into classes. So that's an exciting time as well. Um, as you know, the district is tr really trying to put a focus on college and career readiness. Um, and that was exemplified last week when the sixth grade students at North Rockford Middle School um, had their, student res or their school resource officer give a presentation to sixth graders about what her career is like and how uh, being a school resource officer uh, could be a great uh, future profession for some of our students. Um, on that same day, the seventh grade students were encouraged to participate in a job shadow experience. And I don't know if you caught it, but one of the students of the month actually just mentioned that. So she had obviously taken advantage of that opportunity. And then on May 2, uh, Rockford High School is actually hosting a job fair. Um, and they have more than 20 employers who are going to be coming, talking with our students, um, and figuring out if we have some matches between our Rockford High School students and employers in our community. So that's exciting. 
We also have some celebrations. Seventh grade, North Rockford Middle School, Brady Bowers has qualified for the National Spelling Bee in Washington, D.C. So awesome for Brady. I know that he is hard preparing on that. Um, our Rockford Quiz Bowl team, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, one year ago, Jamie Goring launched this Quiz Bowl team, and in year two, they had not just a varsity program, but also a JBA and a JVB. They had a really successful season, and the varsity actually just competed in state um, this last weekend. So exciting for them to be invited there. She said, well, we did not win, but um, they were quite excited to participate, and they did win some of their matches, which was great. Um, likewise, the River Valley students earned a lunch from the corner bar for their efforts in the classroom and also during testing. And then all the things that Olivia mentioned coming up, all the sports, the co-curriculars, the spring concerts, there's a spring musical for students in grades 8 through 10, excited about prom, the academic ceremonies to culminate for our senior class, and then the River Valley graduation, and followed by the uh, Rockford High School commencement. So, a lot of exciting things. Thank you. Okay, next item is committee reports. Uh, I'm going to turn to Christy, the chair of our policy committee. Yeah, hi. We uh, met for the policy committee meeting on 411. Um, we went through about 15 different changes that Neola recommended. Of those 15, six of them were tobacco related in terms of vaping and aerialized and how that would affect the policy changes. So those are all kind of available for you guys to read through. Some other highlights that we went through, there were two um, board trustees who asked us to review um, public participation in our meetings. So we went through that. Um, we looked at different things that other districts were doing and we have recommended no changes at this time. And then we also, one other thing that I wanted to point out under the policy 0123 philosophy of the board, we had a discussion to add a sentence regarding the board delegating roles and responsibilities to the superintendent. So Corey's going to go over that later. It was a great meeting. Thanks, Christy. Yeah, we do have uh, policy discussion coming up under new business, so we'll go through a lot more detail uh, there as well. But, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Christy. Uh, next is our orchestra report. Back on, please. Thank you. Uh, tonight we're fortunate to have uh, our middle school and high school orchestra teachers here and uh, they've prepared a little report uh, for the Board of Education in our community and so we're excited to have them come up uh, to the uh, podium and, uh, and to uh, introduce uh, their program and to tell us what great things are going on in the orchestra program. Thank you. Um, Dr. Matthews, Central Admin School Board, thanks for giving us the time tonight to be here and share out about our program. As my colleagues and I were reflecting on the school year already um, and the many awesome things that our students are doing, uh, we realized it had been a while since we um, were in front of the school board. And um, since we've, uh, the orchestra department has shared out, there's been a lot of changes to our program. I think the last time um, the orchestra department uh, presented, we were just starting to get uh, some freshmen at the freshman center. And so now we're in our ninth year of the program here at Rockford. Uh, we have a full fleshed out um, high school orchestra program with multiple ensembles, additional staffing, um, some staffing changes, and um, yeah, we have a lot to celebrate and we wanted to share that out with you. So I'm Allie Holden, I teach at North Rockford Middle School. We know we're on a tight schedule tonight, so we're going to keep things moving along. So I'm going to pass it over to Amy. Hi, my name is Amy Tenney. I teach at East Rockford Middle School and just highlighting our numbers that we have currently. When we first started the program in 2014, we had just 70 students. So now we have 139 in three ensembles at the high school, 235 at the middle school levels for a total of 374. Um, and we just want to especially thank the administrators. A lot of programs saw kind of dips in the programs over the past few years, but ours have sustained and grown um, thanks to support from administration. So, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Kyle Pitcher. I teach orchestra at the high school, and I want to tell you a little bit about some of the orchestra events that we've had this school year. Uh, we put on quite a few concerts, fall, winter, and upcoming spring concerts for all of our ensembles, grades 6 through 12. Um, some of those involving community members. Uh, we had Dr. Matthews uh, speak at the sixth grade concerts and kind of do some introductions there. And uh, we had a collaboration concert with our um, concert orchestra at the high school with the Rockford Civic Symphony. Uh, so they got to come out and meet some professional musicians in the community and make that connection outside of the classroom as well. Um, we presented social events for the students that have gotten a chance for them to uh, build some community grades six through 12 
like a pumpkin painting event. We had a tubing event at Cannonsburg that was really fun to build that community. Um, and uh, upcoming for the high schoolers, we're going to have a uh, cookout movie night to celebrate the end of the year that we're so excited for. Um, <laughs> MSBOA, the Michigan School Band and Orchestra Association. Um, we are involved heavily in that and we participated in those events as well. Um, we brought all of our orchestras grade 7 through 12 to festival this year and um, have received good ratings from them. Uh, solo and ensemble, both at the district and the state level. Um, it's, been, it's been a great year for the orchestra events so far. So, so like Kyle said, we, have, we participated in district festival, um, our 7th graders received outstanding feedback, our 8th graders and chamber high school orchestra, symphonic high school orchestra all received superior ratings and the concert orchestra received an excellent rating. Um, we had several students recognized um, via all state orchestra, so we had um, 8th grade Fiona violinist and 7th grade Sam Schlachter, 7th grade violinist, and honorable mentions. Um, with Justin Bennett, who is an 11th grade bassist, and Sadie Jolliffe, who is an 8th grade violinist. So lots of participation there. We had lots of students participate in our Honors Orchestra, which was actually hosted at Rocker High School this year, which is pretty incredible, and we received really great feedback of just the facility in addition, which was fun too. Um, but we had uh, several of our students from North and East that participated in that. And we also have a, several students who participate in extracurricular music opportunities. So this includes private lessons, things like St. Cecilia downtown, and also Grand Rapids Youth Symphony. So the orchestra program had quite a few firsts this year as well. Um, one of the biggest ones um, being our high school orchestra trip. This was the first time we've had a travel trip with the high school orchestras. Uh, just over spring break, we took uh, 43 students and eight chaperones down to Orlando, Florida to perform at Disney Springs. We had a, um, a soundtrack session uh, with uh, Disney professional musicians uh, at Epcot and uh, had to spend a couple days in the parks as well while we were down there. So uh, that was a huge success. Uh, got me excited for more trips to come in the future, more travel experiences to get our students outside of Rockford and to really experience some more of the world. Uh, we had a couple community outreach concerts at the middle school level around uh, the holiday season. We were able to play um, at the Meyer in town and at um, one of the nursing homes in town and just like kind of get out in the community and to be able to uh, share some of the music in the holiday season. And um, this year we have the partnership with uh, the Rockford Education Foundation with the Instrument Fund, which has been so such, such a blessing in order to get instruments in some of the hands of younger students who uh, might have trouble affording them. And it's been a really good boon for the program. I um, am so excited about where our orchestra is headed and um, talking with my two colleagues, we have um, just great plans. Like I think, you know, together we're able to program really creative things, we're able to do really innovative things in our classroom, and I know that's um, in part because of the support of our admin and school board, so we really appreciate that. Um, we also have a vision for our future. Uh, we want to continue to grow our program, and we know that our continued partnership with REF is going to make this possible. We also want to increase visibility in our community um, with outreach opportunities, and it's really important for our students to identify as musicians and um, to share their gifts with others. Um, and it, it also means that uh, we need to do more in the way of recruitment. So at this time, we um, are not up in front of the fifth graders, and uh, fifth graders uh, don't have a lot of education and information about signing up for sixth grade classes, um, but we think if they are provided with some more education and information up front before signing up for their sixth grade music elective, um, that this will help them make more informed decisions. Um, right now we're really proud of retaining about 80 to 90 percent of our students year to year, um, but uh, we need to start some students too. So we want to make some recruitment opportunities happen at the fifth grade and sixth grade level. All right, so we had a lot of different events this year and lots looking forward. So if you're at all interested in participating and attending one of our upcoming events, we have several. Our eighth grade orchestras are going to perform at the State Festival happening at Lowell, which we're very excited to be doing. Seventh grade at both school get to um, perform at the Whitecaps game, May 12th. 
Uh, it's a Friday, so that's a good day to attend. We have our eighth graders, first time in, in several years, are finally able to go to Chicago, which is very exciting. Um, and then we have our upcoming spring concerts as well, which we have listed here for you and that we can share out as well. But at both the middle school and high school level, um, at the middle school level, we are we are having a featured duo, Warren and Foot, um, who are going to be accompanying and highlighting their students as well, which we're looking forward to as well. Uh, and and more. I'm going to turn the next one over to yeah, Kyle for absolutely. our study. So our big exciting thing, uh, the Rockford Orchestra Program has been around for nine years at this point. Uh, next year we'll make 10, and we are going to be holding in early 2024 our uh, Rockford Public Schools Orchestra 10th Anniversary Concert. Um, we're very, very excited about this, looking at early 2024. Um, we're commissioning a piece um, to be written, to be performed and premiered at this um, at this event from Michael Hopkins, who's one of the professors at the University of Michigan. Um, we are playing six through 12, um, everyone, all those orchestra students, all 374 of them, uh, plus whoever we have next year, um, will be there, and it's gonna be a big thing. So we're really excited to share that with you, and we'll share more details when we have them. That's all we have for yeah. you. Thank you so much for Thank your you time all so tonight. Much. Okay, next we have uh, our new elementary report. Thank you, Ms. Folsom. I'll uh, come over here. Uh, let Stephen uh, do his magic there. So I'm going to orchestrate uh, a bit of a report on our uh, uh, new elementary planning. Uh, as all of you know, uh, um, in uh, 2019, the Rockford voters approved a $174 million bond project. A uh, significant part of that bond project was the addition of a new elementary school on the west side of the district, uh, elementary number nine at this point. Uh, those of you who've seen the rampage uh, this month uh, know that we're in, in the process of having a naming, uh, I don't know if it's a competition exactly, but it's a naming contest, uh, uh, trying to generate a, a variety of names uh, that we will uh, narrow down and present uh, to the school board and, and they'll be able to pick the name for the new elementary hopefully either in May or June. Uh, construction began in uh, 2022 with the completion date of the summer of 2024. Uh, the summer of 2022 was not kind to construction uh, as we had a lot of rain and there was a lot of uh, clay in the soil and it didn't drain well and all those things but I've been assured repeatedly that we're on target uh, for our opening in uh, the fall of 2024. And so we'll welcome students in the uh, fall of 2024. So, so uh, as you can see uh, here, the, the rendering, uh, kind of the framework of the, uh, the building. So as you drive along Edgerton, you can see it there. There are various sections. And next month uh, at the board meeting, we'll give you a more detailed uh, uh, kind of overview of the construction project. But it has some new features that we're very excited about. And uh, we'll be able to give you a little bit more update uh, because uh, reports on the new elementary will become a monthly feature of the board meeting just so our community can uh, stay up to date on, on the progress there. So we have four committees that have been established to prepare for the opening of the new elementary. We have Human Resources, uh, headed up by Corey Wilson Crawford, Instruction, headed up by Mike Graham, Communication, headed up by Lisa Jacobs, and Building and Site, headed up by Mike Cuneo. And the committees are meeting at least once a month, and uh, uh, if they need to meet more often, they will do that. So the first uh, committee uh, we'll give a little overview is Mike Cuneo with Building and Site. Mr. Cuneo. Thanks, Dr. Matthews. Yeah, so um, the, the first part is actually the naming of the building itself, and, it, and, and as Dr. Matthews said, that we're in the process of, of, in the process of, of pulling together some information for the board to digest in, in, in terms of the naming of the building itself. Are students encouraged to submit names for the building? It's a good question. I think they are. I've been working with Lisa Jacobs on that piece of it, but yeah. I think they are yes. encouraged yes. on that piece yeah. as well. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> so I'm not sure how many have, su have submitted names so far, but I know that we got a pretty good list going. The other thing is I will tell you is, is we are working on the attendance boundaries, which I'm sure is on everybody's mind. Um, I, I, while we don't have anything to share with the board at this point in time, I will tell you that we are coming up with the committee a criteria of how we're going to develop, of how we come about redrawing those lines. I will also say that we will be looking at redrawing almost all the elementary lines, not really affecting the secondary, but essentially affecting all the elementaries. And we'll be looking at a combination of, of the capacity of those buildings, what future growth will look like, 
and ultimately how the new building fits in with that growth pattern of, of the overall district. Understanding that today's fourth grader, by the time this building opens, will be in middle school. So we so there's some timing issues there that we got to work through, uh, and that's part of the reason why we won't have anything this spring. But we'll be looking forward more towards next fall in terms of coming uh, coming up with something for the board to, to review. And also, of course, operational supply and purchasing. Always new startup costs that's, that are associated with the building. Also with ongoing costs such as, you know, you have your, your various costs for um, the front office, uh, operation and maintenance, and those types of things. So we'll be working on those and, and continue to give updates accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Cuneo. Mr. Cuneo will come back to the board uh, as appropriate uh, with updates from his committee. Uh, human resources, uh, Corey wilson Crawford. Thank you. Yes, uh, human resources can be really challenging to plan for the opening of a new building. And so you'll see there's quite a few tasks on the list here that really have to do with the planning and the movement of current staff and the hiring of new staff, uh, including a building leadership profile that we'll bring forward to Dr. Matthews out of the committee. Uh, we will end up in a spot where we'll be talking about staff onboarding and what that can look like and how people and families can enroll in this building and what that might look like as well. But before we do that, we really have to understand what the attendance boundaries are. So in order for us to really move forward in much of the HR realm, we need to get to a place where we know just who is going to be attending the school so we can plan for those different populations. And then once we have those attendance boundaries figured out, we'll begin the process of really all of the onboarding of staff. Um, and then we have to deal with REA and RESPA working conditions and considerations that they may have at our new building, but also how that brings parity to our other eight elementary school buildings. Because we do want our students and our staff to have a very similar experience across the DK through fifth grade level. And so there'll need to be some planning to ensure that those kind of things can happen. Um, I have 10 people on my committee. We've been meeting just like the other committees. And I do want to share that Mindy Duba is co-chairing the HR committee with me. And so she is another cabinet member that's also heavily involved in the planning um, as we move forward toward new elementary school number nine. And we're all very excited about it. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Crawford. Uh, instruction, uh, Mike Graham. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Um, like the others, I'm excited about leading this uh, group. I have about 10 people on my committee, too. Uh, my committee is uh, obviously focused on some of the elements that you see there, but my committee is made up of some building principals in our district, some directors in our uh, district, some teachers in our district, and then also even a parent uh, that lives in the neighboring community of uh, Saddle Ridge, as we felt like, you know, I feel like they might be invested a little bit there. Um, so it's been exciting. We're working on uh, really an innovative physical space. The design of the building is set up to meet developmental needs of students when it comes to organize, organizing them by grade level um, and then also some extended instructional practices with uh, a blending of the classroom moving out into what we're calling extended learning areas in these pods. Uh, we, the building has a city center and then students have their uh, specific areas and so we understand the importance of onboarding the staff to the space so that uh, and we'll have an intentional plan around that. That building design is intentional and important to uh, meet the developmental needs of kids. We're also looking across the district as the opening of this elementary is an opportunity for us to uh, program across all elementaries in the district. So if we put in an instructional program um, in 24, 25, we want that to have equity across every single student. We have a belief in our district that, um, you know, uh, we talk about a guaranteed and viable uh, curriculum, guaranteed viable experience, that no matter what building that uh, the student attends or what grade level, we should be able to say that this is a consistent experience. So one of the programs that we're looking to advance is a STEAM program for elementary students, and so we have a ramp towards 24-25, we're planning for that, as well as an outdoor education program. You'll notice uh, if you look closer that the school sits on a just a beautiful campus that's full of um, an outdoor area, and so we feel like that's going to be something that we look at not only as uh, for those students, but also for students to come to. We're also looking at our district as a whole and thinking, are there any other special programs that we might take advantage of the opportunity to implement? Maybe not necessarily at that building, but in our, um, in our district. 
as we think about DK placement in the district, uh, this, the new building has four uh, classrooms for DK students. So we know that that will disperse a little bit through the district. We have some people working on that. And then we think around the idea of um, the media centers in our buildings and how does that kind of move with uh, a little bit of the idea that we have new furniture coming into the buildings. Um, we have an opportunity for uh, students to maybe be, have better collaborative spaces. And so we kind of think around um, that piece. And, and then finally, what does the weekly schedule look like for an elementary student? Um, and you know, our committee is considering uh, how we can really provide teachers with um, some success criteria and some uh, better information about trying to just really say, guarantee that possible or that, every, that experience for every single kid. So we're excited about that. Everybody has a specific uh, agenda item and we're, we're reporting back through some committee process. Thank you, Mr. Rand. And uh, finally, Ms. Jacobs, uh, communication updates and planning. Yes, thank you, Dr. Matthews. Uh, so quickly, I will review some key initial um, discussion topics for communications uh, group. And right off the bat, um, as been mentioned multiple times already this evening, uh, naming of the building. And that is really exciting for us. Um, building number nine, we are gathering input from our stakeholders currently um, via our website. Uh, I do want to also mention the fact that we will be continuing that advertising. So our first big push was to send that out through our district new newsletter, the Rampage, but we will also be sending reminders as far as through family access to parents and then also engaging our students. We do have until May 1st, as you can see the deadline there um, to gather that information. And so we hope, as um, Dr. Matthews mentioned, to be able to bring that back to the Board of Education um, for review and selection. So again, that will be coming um, up here quickly uh, for the Board of Education. But again, that's our key right now, and we will continue to push that information out. Um, as you can imagine, our uh, group is very dependent on the work of the others. Um, as far as um, from a collaboration standpoint, we are looking forward to working with HR, uh, building insight, as well as instruction, and continue to uh, move forward with the communication planning um, as things become um, decided in some of the other groups. And for example, the attendance boundary communication planning is somewhat dependent on the others, but. As always, we look forward to collaborating and working and um, fine-tuning that as we um, begin that process um, as far as that, what that will look like and look forward to updating you next month um, as well as overall the new elementary progress communication planning just from a standpoint of what's happening um, ongoing. And I know right now um, as far as just even from construction, uh, I know that we have continued to work with OAK to push out the construction updates um, via their blog and also on the district website. We advertise that in the rampage and so on. So there are things that we have um, been doing, but we will continue to amp up as we go through this process. So we look forward to um, continued communications around elementary number nine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. Uh, so here's kind of the tentative timeline. Uh, January through March of 23, the committees begin meeting. We're seeking community input on the name, uh, uh, district uh, program, cabinet discussion, learning commons, future furniture planning. Uh, April, May, uh, staffing for STEAM and outdoor education for 23-24. So those initiatives are not uh, dependent on the new elementary, but we're rolling them out, uh, continuing to uh, kind of make that part of our district. And that effort will continue for the 23-24 school year. Uh, we're going to establish the preliminary elementary boundary lines, uh, and you'll <coughs> receive the first report, which is tonight. And then June through August, uh, kind of the new building is officially named. Uh, the building principal uh, will be named uh, as well, uh, hopefully this summer. Uh, September through December, district enrollment lines are finalized by, by November uh, 23. Uh, we'll figure out the DK district placements where they will be in each of our buildings, uh, and we'll continue to provide the board uh, elementary school updates. Uh, January through June of 24, uh, the construction will be complete. Uh, Mr. Cuneo assures me it will be complete uh, by June of 24 so that people can move in. Uh, and uh, uh, we will have uh, staffing considerations at that point uh, as we uh, identify who will staff the new building 
and then any curriculum updates uh, from Mr. Ram's office. And then in August of 2024, we will have a great celebratory day when the new elementary opens. So that's the uh, initial report. You're, you're going to get monthly pro progress reports from Cabinet. Uh, you can make inquiries uh, about the, the progress through me. Uh, we're going to ask the board to approve uh, bond dollars for the new elementary. Uh, we'll select the name and approve any boundary changes that need to happen. So any questions from the Board of Education? Have we done redistricting? I mean, when was the last time Rockford had to go through that would have been? That was well, um, Meadow Ridge. That with Meadow Ridge. Okay. And Meadow Ridge opened in? 1999. 1999. So it's been a while. It's been a while. So <laughs> it's always a fun conversation to have with yeah. the community. So. Yeah. so, you know, and there are, there are multiple questions with boundary changes, you know. Is it you rip the band that you often everybody goes, or do you have a standard approach? All those kinds of things, and so so those are the kinds of conversations that we're going to have with the board of education. And uh, you know, as long as we communicate effectively, uh, and, and everybody knows why we're doing the things that we're doing, uh, I, I have great confidence that things will go well. All right, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. So we're moving forward into new business, and we're going to start. With the bottom number seven, move that up to the top. So our Crestwood Administrative Recommendation, Dr. Matthews. Thank you. Uh, this is done uh, because uh, we, we've had Kyle wait long enough uh, for the, this moment. Uh, and so uh, we also know that he has some people here tonight to support him. And uh, we don't want to uh, uh, kind of prolong the drama anymore. And so we'll turn it over to, uh, to Ms. Wilson Cross. And we'll kind of go through the process that we went through and introduce the recommendation. Uh, thank you very much. So we had a mid-year departure of a principal and we put Mr. Avink in as an interim principal and so he's on an interim contract right now which is going to terminate in June um, for that position and when we did that we made a commitment to the staff at Crestwood that we would conduct a full search in the spring of 23 and so the spring of 23 came and we in fact did complete a full search. So what a full administrative search looks like, um, the first step in that process is going to the building and developing a profile with the whole building. So we invited all of the building to come to a meeting um, and we profiled for that position. Exactly what kind of leader was Crestwood looking for? And we used that profile to create a rubric. So we would be able to evaluate all of the candidates fairly based upon what the building felt that they needed and what the cabinet felt that the building needed. And so we posted and we procured resumes from a wide variety of people. Uh, in fact, we procured resumes from 27 qualified candidates and some other candidates who um, didn't meet the de minimis criteria for qualification for a principalship. And out of that, we had a credentialing and a screening process. And then Ms. Jacobs, who you just saw a moment ago, uh, facilitated our first round interviews. We interviewed five candidates with an interview team that was comprised primarily of staff from Crestwood Elementary School. So we had lots of people who expressed interest and we selected um, a variety of people from that building as well as a parent and another administrator. And lo and behold, through two rounds of interviews, it became evident to all involved that a consensus decision was in fact to be had in this search, which is really, really a wonderful thing. And so it is my pleasure, Dr. Matthews, to recommend to you Mr. Kyle Aving to become our principal at Crestwood Elementary School. And so tonight we come uh, to the Board of Education with a recommendation that Kyle Aving be approved as a Crestwood Elementary Principal. Thank you. So can I have a motion I by Kelly, supported by Christy? Any discussion? I don't know anything about this person, so I guess. Uh, uh, Ms. Wilson Crawford, could you give a little bit of a summary of uh, Mr. Avery? Sure, I'd be happy to. His resume is included in the packet as well as my letter of uh, recommendation. But um, Mr. Avink has been an early educator um, in a neighboring district where he was a teacher. He came to our school district after that in the capacity of student activities coordinator. He then was um, selected as an assistant principal in our district where he has served and now he is currently serving in interim capacity at Crestwood Elementary School. He has all of the qualifications to be a principal in our district, which include a teaching certificate, experience leading, as well as a master's degree and uh, administrator's certificate. And he is the best choice based on the committee. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. 
All right, all in favor, raise your hand, say aye. 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 Congratulations. Mr. Amy. All right, I have had the opportunity to serve as the interim principal at Crestwood Elementary for the last uh, three and a half months or so, and it has been an absolute honor to work alongside those staff members every single day. I have been able to see firsthand the incredible work that they do, um, the incredible work they do collegially with each other, um, how they work alongside uh, our family members and our community members, but also the things that they do every single day in the walls of our classrooms. Um, and so it has been a privilege of mine and I look forward to the opportunity con to continue that work. Um, but also I would be amiss if I didn't give the credit where credit is due and that is um, with the, the group of people that are there uh, as staff members at Crestwood Elementary um, and a few of them who are represented here at the board meeting. Um, it, it's a pretty amazing staff over there, and I'm absolutely honored to be a part of it. So, thank you very much. Uh, are there any family members that you would like to introduce tonight? I, yeah, I have my family here as well. Um, so, uh, my spouse and my parents here um, supporting me uh, tonight. So, and we're very excited that they're here to support you. It, it means a lot to, to us as a community that, to know that you have a strong family behind you. Yep. And we look forward to, to working with you and. Uh, 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 seeing you lead uh, over at Crestwood, so congratulations. Thank you, appreciate it. And, uh, Mr. Holcomb, if, uh, if I could uh, have a moment of personal privilege, uh, it's uh, the, we're excited for Mr. Abink and the opportunities that he's going to give to our Crestwood families and staff. Uh, but the most important thing tonight is that if any of those people would like to leave the board meeting at this time, uh, <laughs> they are welcome to do that and we will not be offended. There is, there is an asbestos item coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to point that out. Free to go for that. We'll give you a moment to do that. Okay, up next, uh, going back to the top of the list, our staff appreciation resolution. Dr. Thank you. Uh, uh, May 1st to 5th of 2023 is Staff Appreciation Week, and I'd like to read the Staff Appreciation Resolution uh, for our community. Uh, whereas the Rockford Board of Education is proud to commemorate the week of May 2nd, 2023, or May 1st, 2023 is Staff Appreciation Week, and Tuesday, May 2nd, 2023, is Staff Appreciation Day as a way of expressing appreciation for the vital role that teachers and school employees play in the education of children and recognizing that our future lies in their hands. And whereas teachers and support staff devote their time and talents in an effort to assure that all children succeed, they are role models for children at the most impressionable state in their development, and it is most fitting that we pause to grant them the recognition and praise that they deserve. And whereas teachers and support staff through their work in public schools provide the basis for the preservation of our de democratic heritage, Staff Appreciation Week is an effective and positive way of honoring all the teachers and other school employees for their efforts and their influence on the education of those who will eventually take their place as leaders of America. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Board of Education, the Rockford Board of Education, that we commemorate the week of May 1st as Staff Appreciation Week and Tuesday, May 2nd at, uh, as Staff Appreciation Day for all citizens to recognize Rockford's outstanding and dedicated teachers and support staff. And we bring this uh, for recognition or approval tonight because we do not have another board meeting before May 1st. Okay, thank you, Dr. Matthews. I have a motion to approve the resolution. A motion. Christy, support? By Tricia. All in favor, please raise your hand. Say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. uh, no. Uh, does it need to be a roll call? Because it's a resolution. resolution. So, oh, apologies. That's okay. Right. Yep, that's no, okay. That's we'll, do, okay. we'll do a roll call. Okay. Yep, thanks. Uh, Tricia? Yes. Christy? Yes. Jared? Yes. Kelly? Yes. And Barb? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, up next is our spring policy update, our first reading. 
Court, or Dr. Michael, sorry. Uh, that's okay. Uh, Ms. Wilson Crawford uh, held her committee meeting, uh, and uh, tonight she'll kind of introduce the topics. And uh, between now and the board meeting in May, if you have questions or comments, uh, it would be appropriate to ask Ms. Wilson Crawford, and then we can have a further discussion in May as well. But Ms. Wilson Crawford will introduce uh, the, the policies that were talked about at the committee meeting. Yeah, so I thought maybe I'd take a moment to just kind of explain a little bit about how the policy process works because we have a new board working together and so um, twice a year the policy uh, company that we use to ensure that our board policies are up to snuff legally with the Michigan school code. Um, twice a year they send us some policy review and they say that our NEOLA attorneys that we've hired have reviewed these policies and they're recommending some changes or maybe they're recommending we at least review the policies. So the list that you see in front of you um, has about 15 policies that are up kind of on NEOLA's schedule. And so what we would do then is we would meet as a policy committee and um, Christy Ramsey is a chair of that committee this year. And we would go through each one of those policies and the recommendations that the uh, people from NEOLA who work for us are indicating are up for renewal or discussion. And so you'll see those all here. Um, I want to share with you how to read these policies because between now and the second reading you probably will want to take an opportunity to look at them a little bit in depth and then send me any questions that you might have or bring them here to the next board meeting. So the policies are grouped specifically in numerical order and you can find out a lot about the policies by looking at the call numbers associated with them. And that was new learning for me when I started working in policy and I think it was new learning for some committee members too and so I want to share that with everyone so you'll be able to navigate through the policies easily. So if you look at the list of policies that are in the board packet, you're going to see that the call numbers for the policies are four digits. The first digit in that first position, is that tells you who this policy is targeted at. So if you look at policy 0123, you're going to find that the policies that are all zero, those are board self-governing policies. So the zeros have to do with the board. Right, so when you look in that first position, you see a zero, you always know it's a board policy. If you look at the first position and it's a one, you know that that's a policy that is for administrators. Right, and you can go down the list. Um, you can look at policies that have a two. Those ones are curricular, instruction in nature. You can look at three, that's professional staff. Four, support staff. Five, students. Six, finance. Seven, property. Eight, operations. And nine, community relations. So that first digit will always tell you what the policy is about. If you look at the last two digits of the policy, that will tell you whether or not the policy is duplicative in nature. So on the list you see the policies that you have in front of you. I want to call out policy 1615, 3215, and 4215. Those are duplicative policies. You see that one of them is use of tobacco by administrators, another one of them is use of tobacco by professional staff, and the third one is the use of tobacco by support employees. So when you're reviewing policy documents and you see something like that, you will know that those documents all contain the same types of edits and the same type of information. They just govern different employee groups in that specific instance. So as you go through and read these, you will be able to read those through the lens of kind of understanding a little bit about the structure behind the policies. Now specific to this policy update, this is a little bit of a light policy update for us. There are only 15, and many of the policy updates that you're going to see have uh, very minimal changes in them, primarily editorial changes or changes that are dictated through state school code. So an example of that is going to be the policy 2623, which is about student assessment. We have to update that policy to get in line with Michigan school code around state assessments for students when and how we test using the MSTEP, which is a state requirement, right? So, and then you'll see other policies where there's just some very small changes. Um, our school board can also recommend additional policies to be reviewed or additional policies to be changed. And an example of that is policy 0123, which is the philosophy of the board, where through discussion, the policy committee has asked to put another sentence into that policy. That's not a NEOLA um, spring update. That's a district-specific update. If our board uh, policy committee had recommended a change to public policy, which we discussed, 
you would see that on this list as well. But since no change was recommended, there will be no need to put it on this list, even though it was discussed at the meeting. So I think with this and the minutes from our meeting, and then you have each policy in detail, while you see some red and some green that tells you what the recommended language coming out would be and what the recommended language coming in would be, you probably have enough information to begin the process of really <coughs> understanding what these policy updates might mean. Um, and if you do have any questions or if the minutes aren't sufficient, I'm happy to have an individual meeting with anyone who would like to. All right? If you need anything from me, I'm available. Thank you, Corey. Uh, questions for Corey about any of that? The process, the next steps. We're not voting tonight. This is just first reading, so we've got a month to do a deeper dive review. Get with Corey if you have questions in the meantime. We'll talk about it again next month. But anybody from the group, questions top of mind? Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Up next is tenure teacher approval. Dr. Matthews. And we will turn uh, to Ms. Wilson Crawford for this as well. It's a busy time in HR. Uh, <laughs> so the Michigan Tenure Act uh, requires districts to confer or grant tenure upon staff members who have a professional teaching certificate who are acting in a professional role within our system. Um, when a teacher has served a five-year probationary period, at the end of that fifth year, school boards grant or confer tenure upon those people who've had successful service in our school district. So you'll see a list of 21 professional educators who we have employed for five years who we would need to grant tenure on before they start their sixth year of employment in our school district. All of the people on this list have had a very interesting probationary period uh, because they started school with us and then we had a lot of difficult influence over the next few years of their tenure here. And they all did an outstanding job working with students in very difficult times. Uh, all of them have an effective or highly effective rating on their evaluations. And all of them have stuck with our school district through the last five years, which in and of itself is a real yeoman's task. And so you'll see those um, 21 teachers who've been here for five years. You'll also see a few teachers at the top that are actually um, in the middle of a two-year probationary period. So actually, they're almost done with that two-year probationary period. If a teacher had attained tenure in a previous job, so let's say we had a teacher that worked in a neighboring district and they had tenure there. And then they were employed by Rockford Schools and they came to work here. Then after two years of successful teaching, they can be granted tenure as well if they are effective or highly effective on their end of school year evaluations. And so that's why you'll see those few at the top. That's because they came with experience that included tenure in another school district. So Dr. Matthews, it's my recommendation that we can for tenure upon these people at the end of this year. Thank you, Mr. Wilson Crawford. So that's the recommendation this evening and we would bring this to the board to approve this recommendation that these teachers would re receive tenure at the end of this school year. Thank you. Can I have a motion? I move. Kelly? Support. Support. Tricia? Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand say aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries. Up next is our bond ratifying resolution. Uh, Mr. Cuneo is feeling left out of the board meeting, and so uh, he has three items coming up uh, for us here. And uh, the first one is a bond ratifying resolution, which is very good news for our district. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. And Ian Cuffler is right over here. Come on up here. Uh, he's our attorney from Truman who oversaw the legal side of this transaction. So just as a little bit of history to the board, 2019, as Dr. Matthews had pointed out, we passed a $174 million, the community did, $174 million bond issue. Part of that is a 10-year build-out where we're going to issue those bonds at 3-7 series. This past Tuesday, we actually had the sale of the second series of approximately $81 million. The Board of Education had approved the uh, initiative to move forward with this particular issue in February, <clears throat> this past February, and now we have essentially the closing documents, the ratifying resolution, which I'll have Ian go through and highlight, and then I'll have a couple of follow-up summaries with that. Sure, as Mike mentioned, uh, tonight we're really presenting the results of the bond sale to the board. Uh, you guys already authorized the issuance of the bonds on February 13th. And uh, on April 13th, the bonds were sold. I uh, have a little bit of the financial details, although I'm an, I'm an attorney. So <laughs> we do the legalese. Uh, your financial advisor, PFM, they do all the number crunching. So 
I uh, do have those results if you're interested, but uh, successful bond sale on the 13th, and now we're following through on getting all the paperwork completed to make sure that uh, we're in compliance with Michigan state law, federal tax law, and federal securities law. So happy to answer any questions that you may have. And the, if I could just follow up real quick. Um, uh, so in terms of some of the financials, uh, 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 it was a successful issue in the fact that, you know, we look at things from a, a, a pre-sale listing and then compared to where we actually ended up at. And actually our interest rate, our net interest rate, uh, ended up a little bit less than what we had anticipated. And uh, it was good activity that was out there. Some of the major players who bought uh, our bonds were Vanguard. We also had Goldman Sachs. Uh, BlackRock Financial, so, so they're major players in the industry. Um, and, and they look at these as safe investments, obviously. I mean, the school district uh, being a governmental entity and stuff, um, and, and especially in Rockford with where taxable values are and such, is a solid community and it was looked favorably upon the, upon the market on that day. So I ended up with a little bit of good news when that started in, in, into the, the, or the weeds, but we had the CPI index that came out that came out a little bit less than anticipated, which did, uh, which basically said our yields were better, ultimately is how it worked out. So anyway, we look forward to the closing of this and then ultimately utilizing those monies uh, for, the for the projects that I'll be listing here afterwards. And uh, two kind of follow-ups there, Mr. Cuneo. Uh, one is, uh, part of this process is uh, the district has to go out for a bond rating. Yes. And, yes. and uh, you, can you just describe Yeah, so that? the bond rating itself, and, and it's, pretty, it's pretty intensive, um, you basically have a round of discussion that you have with the, with the financial analysts, and then you also have, uh, in this case, it was Moody's rating that came out, or no, San Andy Coors, I'm sorry, Moody's was with our other stuff, but anyway, they come out and they ask a very serious, a series of questions, looking at what our financials are today, what we predict they're going to be in the future, and also what our taxable value base is going to be today, what's the economic activity, how does that look, and, and we came out with, uh, uh, a double A rating for the underlying underwriting of the bonds itself, an A rating of moving forward, uh, which stayed the same from what it was previous when we previously issued the first $55 million. So good news uh, during this time frame. Because some districts in the state of Michigan actually had their bond rating lowered uh, yes. during the, the last couple of yes. months. Actually. Yes. We were very fortunate to, to maintain at least the same rating, which is a very good rating. And then the second uh, point is this is this resolution is required to be passed by the Board of Education, correct? That's right, yes. There are uh, specifically enumerated powers that can only be reserved to a board, and issuance of bonds is one of them. So you guys get the last word. So the recommendation would be to move forward with the ratifying resolution with a roll call vote. So you have the ratifying resolution in, in front of you, uh, and uh, as was mentioned, this is a roll call vote, and so we would uh, ask the board to move forward. Can I hear a motion? A motion. Just need support. All support. Kelly, any other questions or discussions? Okay. Trisha? Yes. Chrissy? Yes. Jared? Yes. Kelly? Yes. Mark? Yes. Thank you uh, to the Board of Education. Thank you uh, for coming tonight. And uh, you, you came on a nice night to see a lot of celebration here in, in, with our district. But None of the kids said uh, they wanted to be a bother. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll have you come for period. Uh, I'd be glad to do it. Thank you. Okay, up next is uh, asbestos abatement. Uh, this is another highlight that Mr. Cuneo likes to bring to the Board of Education. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dr. Matthews. I know everybody waits with bated breath with this, but just a, 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 a little bit of re uh, talk to the board. Um, um, you know, asbestos, uh, we do have in some of our buildings. Now, it's not illegal to have asbestos, but we also have to make sure that where we have asbestos is that it is contained, okay? And we have inspectors and what have you that go through our buildings that look at that particular issue. As we've been touching these buildings, one of the things that we have been doing is, is getting rid of the asbestos that is there. Um, with the tearing down and rebuilding of the transportation center and then all the work that we're doing at North Rockford Middle School, we are taking care of those issues at those particular buildings. And I have Sean Hayward, our director of operations, to summarize the timing and, and some of the uh, uh, scope of what we're looking at for that. Thanks, Mr. Cuneo. Um, as Mike has said, we've, we're going through as we touch the buildings, we remove it. Uh, this project that we have at North is uh, quite a small uh, asbestos abatement project we have there. It is uh, contained on the beams up above the ceiling, and uh, they're going to be doing that service or that work there from the 12th of June until the 16th of June. 
Um, because of that work, the, the safety is the utmost importance. So we have uh, eliminated any activities in the building at that time. Um, we're not going to have any camps or swimming or any of the staff members in the buildings. Uh, they do a containment around the area, so it's only contained in that space, and then they do uh, what they call a clearance test to make sure that everything is out of the building afterwards. And that clearance test is done uh, at a lab. They uh, test the air to make sure there is no particulates in the space. Uh, the, the second area that we have is uh, transportation. That's going to be uh, removed June 2nd through the 5th. And again, that space is going to be vacated from all staff members on the 1st, so they'll have free reign of that building at that time. The asbestos is located on the exterior of the building behind the steel, uh, just at the at like two to three foot up on the exterior of the building. So that's what we have going on at this project at this so, time. I have a question. So yes. My understanding is that school goes to the 2nd. Our bus is going to run on the 2nd? Yes, but they... Um, all of the staff will they will not be allowed in the buildings okay. and it's a half a day okay. so they're going to start after school is out and the buses are back okay. so they're going to start in the afternoon on the second awesome. so make sure no one's in the building <laughs> so um, I, I, mr hayward hayward went out uh, we, we we solicited for bids and what is being recommended is the low bid by quality environment environmental services incorporated for thirty seven thousand five hundred dollars there were allowances that were made in the two projects for this abatement, and uh, that is the recommendation. So we've come to the board tonight uh, and ask you to approve this uh, recommendation for asbestos abatement. Okay, thank you. I have a motion. So moved. Trisha. Supported by Kelly. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. And then lastly, baseball softball. Uh, Mr. Cuneo uh, is here as well to talk about our uh, uh, exciting project at the baseball and softball field. So this is the, the second phase of the baseball softball field. Uh, originally the, the Board of Education had approved the turf portion of, the, of this and this is the excavation portion. This is the last thing I should bring to you with baseball softball at this point in time, I've been assured. Uh, just as a reminder to the board, again this with the other projects that I talked about is coming out of our 2019 bond issue. Uh, these are significant dollars, but these dollars cannot be used for general operations of the school district. It has to go specifically for these types of construction pro pro projects that have been approved uh, with the 2019 issue and such. So, so uh, the recommendation is to go with Grattan excavating. Uh, this is a, it's the low bid and significantly lower than uh, uh, the other bids that we out that were out there. Um, we have used Grattan excavating for those individuals who are familiar with the uh, new. Uh, parking lot that is we call the Brewer House parking lot, but it's essentially to the south of uh, get my directions right to the south of the baseball softball fields. Uh, they've done that that portion. They've done a nice job for us, and they're very aggressive on their bidding. So with that, and including um, general fees and conditions uh, conditions and contingencies, we're looking at a bid of approximately seven hundred eleven thousand four hundred and thirty four dollars again to be paid out of uh, the two thousand nineteen bond issue. And when would this project start? This will start right after the act baseball and softball activities are done this year. And uh, uh, estimated completion time? Uh, estimated completion date is by fall, later fall of, of 2023, with the idea that um, uh, by a year from now, when it's all rainy all over the place and muddy, that we have fields to play on and we won't have to cancel. And this was part of the original 2019? That's correct. That's correct. So we would come to the board with that recommendation this evening and ask the board to approve that. Thank you. I have a motion. I have a motion. Christy, and support? Support. Tricia, any other questions or discussion? Okay, all in favor, please raise your hands say aye. 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 All right. And that concludes our new business for this evening. It does. So up next is our uh, recognition of visitors and hearing of people present. I'd like to make a brief statement, if I could, um, to outline guidelines for our public comment portion of our meetings. So first and foremost, we value and welcome input and feedback from the community. We believe that a collaborative relationship between our schools and the community is essential to achieving our shared goals. Public comment at the board meeting is intended to give the community an opportunity to comment on issues in Rockford Public Schools. 
At our meetings, the board and individual board members will not directly respond to comments or questions that arise during the public participation portion of the meeting. If a follow-up is needed, the superintendent will contact the speaker for additional insight or to provide clarification. To ensure everyone has an opportunity to be heard, we ask you limit your comments to three minutes. This will help us accommodate as many speakers as possible and ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to express their views. Please be respectful in your comments and refrain from using inappropriate language or engaging in personal attacks. We want to create an environment where everyone feels comfortable expressing their opinions without fear of retribution or harassment. We encourage you to provide constructive feedback and suggestions for improvement. Your comments can help us to identify areas where we can improve our schools and better serve our students and families. Thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts with us. We appreciate your engagement. Look forward to working together to ensure that our schools continue to be a source of pride for our community. And lastly, public comment in our board meetings is but one way to provide feedback and suggestions. It's certainly not the only way. Those who prefer other means to communicate can do so via email, through our district website, or by calling the superintendent's office, just to name a couple. With that, we have eight individuals who signed up to speak tonight. And our timer set, I see, we'll start with Brenda Wadarski. Is Brenda here? No, I don't see Brenda. Okay. Uh, next on the list is Charles Curtis. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, last month, uh, when Barb Helms labeled as craft the new uh, newly approved seventh and eighth grade language arts curriculum, she wasn't wrong. We have now the first receipts, and it is far worse than crap. One of the first literature units being forced on students is essentially a promotion piece for the religion of Satan entitled The Thrill of Horror with essays to be studied entitled Blood and Hades, Lord of the Dead. There's no room in our schools for the Christian religion and the Bible is literature, but we have open Satanist propaganda. What in the world is going on? This is so disturbing. Barb was the only one doing the necessary due diligence to protect our children. The rest were sweet talked by the administration to blindly trust the process and accept their questionable conclusion. And they made every effort to shut her up and attempt to quickly come to a vote with little or no discussion. Dr. Matthews and Mr. Ram assured you with all of their language that the process was robust and they brought together all stakeholders and educational experts in a noble collaborative process that unanimously determined the best possible curriculum. As Barb would say, that's a bunch of crap. Once the one stakeholder conveniently omitted was parents. Every parent should be thankful Barb is on the board advocating for them and should make every effort to vote in more board members just like her at the earliest opportunity. Barb Helms was right. And the rest of you are wrong. You need to rethink your bonded process because a craft curriculum is the result of a broken pro process and results in dangerous anti-educational dribble. This unit was designed by a sick, sick people not to educate, but rather to brainwash and emotionally condition children to accept an anti-Christian and very dark worldview. This is shameful. Do better. It is your responsibility to make sure the recommendations of the administration are good ones and are not and not be guilty of rubber stamping this type of propagandized crap. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Up next is Craig Lingham. Can I use some of the clips on the whiteboard? Is that okay? We can use the whiteboard over here. Or I just, have some, I just have some pictures I just wanted to share with the public as far as uh, my, uh, my public county goes as far as this public. So, Craig Lehman, uh, ran for school board. Hopefully everybody's having a good day. How's everyone's uh, new world order takeover going, huh? I'll tell you why. So, what we found out a little bit, folks, is that uh, we're operating underneath what they call an overthrow. Overthrow, basically, clearly established law, okay? happened on June 3rd of 2020 in Grand Rapids in front of the police station, okay? This was under threat and arrest. The sheriff of the county, along with their deputies, kneeled down to the BLM mob, who was also there, with Alicia Bates, who was the co-organizer of that, the then police chief, who was also there. They were also seen sharing the same microphone, microphone addressing this particular crowd, okay? 
on video of this protest, Alicia Bates talked to the then security or the then police chief of Grand Rapids, hey, we're gonna meet in a couple of days and we're gonna go ahead and discuss our demands. Okay? So the next phase of that is right here. This particular letter from the KISA comes out on June 5th of 2020. <laughs> Sir, I was not happy to talk. So June 5th, 2020, a letter comes out after the kneel down saying, hey, we are the Kent County School Superintendents Association. Because of the George Floyd event, which pretty much was a fraudulent event utilized to under threatened arrest, put you into a negotiation position of kneeling down. You surrendered all of your rights that day. The superintendents are not elected by the people at all. The, the, the elected people are the school board members. So these folks, including the Grand Rapids Diocese and the Grand Rapids Christian School, all signed on to this document two days after BLM kneeled down from the sheriff. We've been operating under an overthrow ever since then. That's why none of this stuff makes sense. That's why you have curriculums that nobody voted for that's getting implemented right now. And this will continue to be challenged, okay? We are not going to live under the overthrow of clearly established law. We are not going to let rhinos like the sheriff and ignorant Christians like those at the Catholic Diocese and the Grand Rapids Christian Schools destroy it is existential. Existential means that if you allow this to happen, you do not have community or society or liberty whatsoever. You are operating under the fear of the mob, basically, is what you got here. Fear of the mob. Fear of those that will destroy you because you decided to stand up for something. You didn't kneel down to this because this was threat and duress. Anything under threat and duress is fraud, okay? Once this comes up to vote, it is fraud and it's null and void. It's not that we don't like other people and their different beliefs. We just choose not to be ruled by the mob. Understand? Thank you for your time. Okay, up next is Connie Mulders. Connie here. Um, I'm going to start with a short little quote from um, Martin Luther King Jr. There comes a time when silence is a betrayal. And that's why I am having a hard time being silent. Um, first, I appreciated the CPR update last month with the school nurses. They work hard, and I am 100% behind our teams being certified in CPR. But I also need to give an update of the repercussions of teaching this to kindergartners um, after that. My grandson thought it would be okay to practice his newly learned skill on his four-month-old brother. Well, his mom's holding on to the baby. Um, crisis averted. Uh, we had another long conversation about how you never do CPR on anyone. And he only needs, his instructions are, you need to find an adult and go to the adult if you see something happen. Um, apparently, they would practice in class on the floor, and then they would get a prize. And I was also told by them that they practice on each other on the playground. I know I was a pair pro out on the playground, and you can't have eyes on all the kids all the time. So I understand that. But that's what happens when you teach a five-year-old or six-year-old how to do something they want to try it out. Um, second, I'm going to go into the ELA thrill of horror in a little bit. My eighth grade granddaughter has never seen any horror movies and or read any horror books. Yet she was expected to write a paper on something horrific. My first thought when I heard about this and after hearing about all the recent shootings is, do you really want kids um, writing and being encouraged to write a manifesto? Um, her teacher did send out an explanation today which was helpful and appreciated. Interesting, though, because the class already started the unit. Um, was this damage control email because someone, her parents were having an issue with this unit? Hopefully, in the future, all curriculum will be age-appropriate, transparent, and online to examine beforehand. 
Okay, up next is Jacqueline Jackson. <clears throat> My name is Jackie Jackson, and I'm a second grade teacher at Crestwood Elementary. Excuse my written speech, but I'm accustomed to eight-year-olds, and grown-ups throw me off a little bit. So I haven't seen you all since last spring when I was an enthusiastic watcher of the superintendent interview process. I would first off like to thank you for bringing us Dr. Matthews. He has been such a beacon of joy and hope for us, and his advocacy for his district and dedication to transparency has been inspiring. It is such an honor to serve under him. Secondly, I'd like to thank you for this baby. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for a curriculum that you approved last spring. You have the heavy task of making decisions for our entire district, and I'm not sure you always get to see the fruits of your labor. This is called From Phonics to Reading. It is a curriculum that was adopted this school year for grades kindergarten through third. It is a systematic, <clears throat> explicit phonics program supported by the most current research but beyond that, it is an engaging, encompassing literacy curriculum that is teaching our youngest readers to be skillful, masterful, competent decoders. In eight short months, I have witnessed my students grow from the less effective guess and check method to using syllabication and phonics knowledge to confidently decode multi-syllabic words. I am seeing their skills being generalized and transferred across disciplines, and I am watching my second graders develop into learners who are in control of their education because they possess the superpower to decode and understand language. It's truly remarkable. I just want to say thank you for providing us with such a quality, meaningful curriculum to support our instruction. Lastly, I would like to thank you for your tireless commitment to bettering our school district and for all of the decisions you make on our behalf. RPS teachers truly appreciate you more than you can even imagine. We are eternally grateful and are here to support you in any way we can. So thank you so much for your time, and thank you for all you do. Okay, up next is Mary Fountain. Is here? Um, Mary Fountain, Rockford resident and parent. Rockford school board and board policies have changed more and more to exclude parents from participating in their children's education. Board meetings are now an hour earlier, making it more difficult for working parents to attend. Public comment policy was changed to create a rule that anyone who wishes to speak must register at least five hours in advance of the meeting. I've attended meetings where the board business has prompted attendees to want to address the board and their ability to speak has been shut down. Rockford parents, it's time to wake up, become more engaged, and demand change. I was appalled by the actions of the board last week, silencing one member when they brought up valid concerns about new curriculum. The curriculum development policy is managed through the Assistant Superintendent of Instruction and Curriculum Council. Do you, the council must be composed of the superintendent, assistant, a super, superintendent of instruction, all the principals, two teachers from each school or grade level or subject area, and two representatives from the special education department. The assistant superintendent, superintendent of instruction may establish working committees to find their purpose and select their members. Do you notice who's absent from this process? Parents. We need to ask ourselves why right why RPS is pushing to keep parents away from participating in our children's education. Why are they not allowing the public 30 days to view and review curriculum before approval like many other local districts? Why are they pushing for enforcing the vote for curriculum most board members don't personally know enough about to truly make an informed vote for our kids? Why is Rockford community sitting back and just accepting this? Parents, I beg you to become more engaged in your kid's school career, not just the sport aspect, but the academics. Take a look at what they're learning. Look at their homework and graded work when they come home. You might be surprised at what you find. Although this year, my kids have been bringing less and less graded work home. After asking them why, they told me they throw away their graded work into recycling bins. I asked why, and I told them I want them bringing all of their work home. They told me their teachers tell them to recycle it. My son started sixth grade this year, middle school. It's a big deal for them. 
One of my sons came home during the first trimester and asked why school couldn't be like it used to. I asked what he meant. He said, all school is now is, are you black or white, gay or straight, liberal or conservative? And he was just sick of it. Our kids are forced to watch CNN several days a week. CNN has hit a 10-year low in viewership. Unfortunately, our kids are their captive audience for this trash. My son talked to me after the episode commemorating January 6th. His teacher went on to talk about the right-wing extremists that had rioted and beat some police officers to death that day. Let's all remember there was only one person murdered that day. It was an unarmed woman, a, a veteran, who was shot in the back. Okay, up next is Sonia Andrews. Hi, I'm here to speak tonight on behalf of the um, professional certified staff members um, who are members of the Northwood Education Association. Two reasons, one, to thank the board for passing the 23-24 calendar last month. Um, the calendar was a collaborative effort between Mike Graham, Corey Wilson Crawford, and the association, and the association wants to recognize Mike and Corey for their collaborative effort with the association to really bring together all of the interests of all of the people that are impacted by a school calendar. One might think it's an easy thing to put together, but when you're weighing all the interests and issues um, of parents and students and staff members, it's a big task, and Mike and Corey um, were great uh, partners to have in that process. Additionally, you probably know that Ari and Respa are also in the midst of um, salary and wage negotiations, and you won't find many association leaders who say they're excited to go into negotiations, but I hope the board knows and is proud of the um, partnership and the collaborative relationship that has been developed over the past few years between administration and association members, both in REA and RASPA, that have really allowed us to take something that could be very adversarial and very difficult and instead turn it into a positive, productive process where we both come to the table with our own interests, but we find a way to uh, create common goals from those and a process to achieve the interests on both sides. Thank you. And last tonight is Andrea Jacobson. Good evening, Board of Education, Dr. Matthews, and Central Office Administration. Tonight we've heard a lot about great things happening in our district, from fine arts to athletic accomplishments and academic achievements. Our students wouldn't be able to do those things without the support and guidance of their teachers and coaches. To any of our teachers and coaches who are here this evening, thank you for the hard work that you do. You are the first contacts with students and parents, and I know that comes with a lot of challenges and can be physically and mentally exhausting. Not only are you caring for your students, but many of you are also caring for your own families. Thank you for being present and doing that work day after day in and out of the classroom. I'd like to thank the Board of Education and Administration for their continued focus on making RPS a great place to work so that we can attract and retain those highly qualified coaches, teachers, and building administrators. Mr. Avick, you're leaving big shoes to fill at East. Our loss is Crestwood's gain. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, uh, last item on the agenda is Superintendent Marks, Dr. Matthews. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Folsom. Uh, a unit uh, of our new middle school language arts curriculum was discussed uh, tonight. Uh, the new language arts curriculum provides our students with meaningful opportunities to explore a wide variety of genres as we attempt to develop strong readers and writers. And as was mentioned this evening, one of those uh, units is a horror unit. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, based on the comments this evening, uh, we can do a better job of communicating and ensuring that our teachers communicate to our parents uh, about the units of study uh, that are being undertaken in our buildings. And we'll review our processes, Mr. Ram and I, uh, to ensure that we find ways to have additional parental involvement uh, beyond uh, our Interschool Advisory Council and, and other parent groups that we uh, uh, talk with. Our professional rationale should be seen and heard by our community and especially by our parents. Uh, horror is a genre that interests uh, many students. Uh, some of the most popular books in our media centers are in the horror genre. Uh, books by Jonathan Rand, a Michigan author who writes the Michigan Chillers and American Chillers series, are in our libraries and checked out frequently. 
uh, TV shows like Stranger Things, uh, classics like Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, or poems and short stories by Ed Edgar Allan Poe, uh, like The Telltale Heart are still popular and in our media centers. In our case, the unit is, is uh, not about horror, but uses horror to teach other important skills. Our unit uses horror to help students understand the tools of writing. It provides an opportunity for our students to see how authors use techniques to engage readers, and is hopefully a springboard to help our young writers learn these tools so that they can become effective in their use of language. Now, the role of the board is to ensure that we have a good process that provides our students with opportunities for success. Now, the board, while not experts in curriculum design or curriculum development, work to ensure that as a district we create a process that will bring to our district outstanding curriculum options. Uh, I believe that, that our new ELA curriculum is a, is a positive option for our students that engages them in ways that many will find interesting. Uh, we had a strong cross-section of teachers who universally felt that this curriculum would be pos a positive addition to our district. Uh, the curriculum, developed by some of the most respected language arts thinkers in the nation, will be a positive part uh, of, of our district and help our students move forward. And as always, if parents have concerns about the curriculum, they uh, should talk with their teachers and uh, with the principals at the building, and alternative assignments uh, clearly uh, can be given. <clears throat> Uh, it was mentioned this evening that uh, CNN uh, is, is in our uh, buildings, and uh, I have been in our buildings uh, throughout the district uh, many times that, uh, this year and have not seen CNN in our schools. Uh, I do not doubt that it is used occasionally, uh, and I'll review this with our building principals to ensure that it's used in appropriate ways. Our goal is to ensure that we have informed students who can participate in our world uh, in meaningful ways. Tonight we were once again able to see what makes our Rockford public school community so important. We recognize state champions, we learn more about student opportunities. Uh, tonight uh, it was the orchestra program. We also began discussions about the new elementary building uh, being ready for a fall 2024 move-in. Good things continue to happen in our district. Are there areas where we can improve? Absolutely there are. We look for feedback from our community at board meetings at our inner school council, at uh, building PTO meetings. Uh, in the fall, uh, this past fall and in uh, fall's upcoming, there will be cookies with the superintendent meetings again. Uh, and you can always email and phone uh, any uh, building level administrator or to my office as well. There will be times when we disagree, uh, but I have great confidence that we can also find ways to support each other and respect our differences while continuing to move ahead to support our students and staff. And that concludes my report, Mr. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. And with that, we're adjourned. Thanks, everybody.